minds can be in tune with you and that we will allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us in a very special way as we go uh, through this study today and as we begin this study for the next quarter. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> well, I want to share a couple of things with you, as I always do, uh, in relationship before we get into uh, our study guide. I have a couple of things to share with you from devotionals this morning. One is a book called Lift Him Up. Lift Him Up. And uh, it is entitled, He Represents the Father. He Represents the Father. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. That's from John chapter 17, verses 25 and 26. He goes on to say, Christ came into the world to represent the Father to man. For Satan had presented him before the world in a false light. Because God is a God of justice, of terrible majesty, who has power to destroy as well as to preserve man, Satan caused men to regard him with fear. To look upon him as a tyrant. Jesus had been with the Father from the everlasting ages before the creation of man. And he came to reveal the Father, declaring God is love. Jesus represented God as a kind Father who careth for the subjects of his kingdom. He declared that not a sparrow falls to the ground without the notice of the Father, and that the children of men are of more value in his sight than many sparrows, that the very hairs of their head are all numbered. The Lord is represented in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, not only as a God of justice, but as a father of infinite love. The psalmist says, The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor regarded us according to to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Satan had clothed the Father in his own attributes, but Christ represented him in his true character of benevolence and love. In the character in which Christ presented him to the world, it was as if he gave a new gift to man. The Son of God declared in positive terms that the world was destitute of the knowledge of God. But this knowledge was of the highest value, and it was his own peculiar gift. The inestimable treasure which he brought into the world, in the exercise of his sovereign prerogative, he imparted to his disciples the knowledge of the character of God, in order that they might communicate it to the world. Everyone who believes the message of God should lift up Jesus, point men to Christ, and say, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The soul imbued with the love of Christ is one with him. He communes with Christ. Christ is formed within. The hope of glory and the Christian goes forth to represent the Father and the Son to the world. And this comes from a magazine called The Signs of the Times back in June of 1892. June of 1892 is where that comes from. I have another one here. Let me look it up. Got to go to another book. It's going to come from a book that's entitled That I May Know Him. That I May Know Him is the book and it's entitled The Mystery of Sin. The Mystery of Sin. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity 
was found in thee. That's from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, verses 14 and 15. It is impossible to explain the origin of sin so as to give a reason for its existence. Yet enough may be understood concerning both the origin and the final disposition of sin to make fully manifest the justice and benevolence of God in all his dealings with evil. Nothing is more plainly taught in scripture than that God was in no wise responsible for the entrance of sin. Sin is an intruder for whose presence no reason can be given. It is mysterious, unaccountable. To excuse it is to defend it. Could excuse for it be found or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. I'll read that one again because I want you to comprehend that. Could excuse be found for it, talking about sin, or cause be shown for its existence, it would cease to be sin. Our only definition of sin is that given in the word of God, it is the transgression of the law. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. It is the outworking of a principle at war with the great law of love, which is the foundation of the divine government. Now, that comes from a book called The Great Controversy. I'm going to read that again. It is the outworking of a principle at war with the great law of love, which is the foundation of the divine government. Sin originated in self-seeking. Lucifer, the covering cherub, Desired to be first. Desired to be first in heaven. He sought to gain control of heavenly beings to draw them away from their creator and to win their homage to himself. Thus, he deceived angels. Thus, he deceived men. He led them to doubt the word of God and to distrust his goodness. Thus, he drew men to join him in rebellion against God, and the night of woe settled down upon the world. That's from a book called Desire of Ages. That's where that quote comes from. Sin appeared in a perfect universe. The reason of its inception or development was never explained and never can be. Even at the last great day, when the judgment shall sit and the books be opened. At that day, it will be evident to all that there is not and never was any cause for sin. It will be evident to all that there is not and never was any cause for sin. At the final condemnation of Satan and his angels, and of all men who have finally identified themselves with him as transgressors of God's law, every mouth will be stopped. When the hosts of rebellion, from the first great rebel to the last transgressor, are asked why they have broken the law of God, they will be speechless. There will be no answer to give. That comes from the magazine Signs of the Times back in April of 1890. When the hosts of rebellion, from the first great rebel, to the last transgressor, are asked why they have broken the law of God, they will be speechless. There will be no answer to give. No answer to give. No. No answer to give. Today's title of our study. It's on page uh, six of your study guides. It is entitled A Preamble to Deuteronomy. A Preamble to Deuteronomy. Mike? 
Before we move on, a couple thoughts. One, uh, that last that you read, we don't have to fear judgment. We who believe in Jesus Christ as saving us, the Father has testified, we'll have eternal life. We won't have to answer judgment. It's those who refuse the grace of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Agreed? Agreed, yeah. In Romans, the fifth chapter, Paul says, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. So there's the purpose of the law. He also says over in 7, the law can't save us in chapter 7. But the point that I was going to make is over in chapter 14, and, it's, and it starts off about don't let he who eats meat condemn him who eats vegetables and him, yada, yada, yada. Right. At the end of that chapter, it's, 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 you may have faith to believe that there is nothing wrong with what you're doing. But keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who do not condemn themselves by doing something they know is all right. But if people have doubts about whether they should eat something, they shouldn't eat it. They will be condemned for not acting in faith before God. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. Let me share a personal experience. 30 years ago. Vicki and I, uh, at the time, were living in a travel trailer out by Mechanicsburg at a camp. And on a Friday evening, I was out praying before God. And I heard a voice down in here, you know, not out loud, because I had just prayed, Lord, what do I need to give up in my life that would please you? <laughs> and he said, quit speeding. Now, I'm not saying that. For all of you, you need to quit speeding. I'm talking about me, all right? Right. And for 25 years, right. I struggled with that. 25 years. Five years ago, when I was working at the state, I was late one morning. I had a meeting set up that I set up, and all these engineers from, from Indianapolis were all going to be there. And so I get in Vicky's little speedster, and I'm taking the back roads, and I'm going 80 and 90 mile an hour, and I'm looking... Lawrence can identify with this, for headlights coming the other way through <laughs> because the corn was this tall. <coughs> and so I was blowing all those stop signs. And I got down to US 40 and I turned right and I'm, I'm passing and, and I get behind this semi and he's going through downtown Greenfield and, and he's going through on yellow so I'm going through on red. I pull in the parking lot Here's two county sheriff officers pull in behind me and an unmarked officer. Before I saw them, I lowered my head. I said, Lord, I am never going to do this again, even if it costs me something. You have asked me years ago to quit doing this. I know that I just sinned because you had asked me not to do this. I said, amen, I got out of the car, and here's these officers. And, of course, you know, you got to give them your license. 90 mile an hour, you know, the one officer was in the unmarked car. He said, you passed my house like a blur. He said, and I've been trying to get, catch up with you and couldn't catch up with you. He said, I should take you to jail right now. He said, but there's a voice inside of me telling me, to let you go. I was shaking. I wasn't shaking because I had been caught. I was shaking that the Spirit of God was speaking to this officer and he was a Christian man. And <clears throat> the officers came back around and the other two were looking at him and he's Turns out he's the assistant sheriff of Hancock County. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I had one of the top guys chasing me. And we had a little prayer session there because I prayed for him and I thanked him. But I thanked God later that morning as I wept with tears. What an excellent example of God's grace uh -huh. when we don't deserve it. <clears throat> but it's also because God had asked me years ago not to do that. And I knew it was sin. Lawrence has been with me when I've gotten pulled over and gotten tickets before. You know, every time I knew I was breaking what God had asked me to do. So the right. Spirit of God will right. direct our paths. Right. 
Yeah, thank you. Well, the text for this week is a text that's very familiar. There's even a little song that the young people sing. He who does not love... He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Yeah. For God is love. Notice what it says here. The book of Deuteronomy, of course, did not arise in a vacuum. As with everything in life, Deuteronomy exists in a context. And as everything in life, that context plays an important role in understanding what the book means and what its purpose is. A lot of history came before it. A lot of history explained the circumstances, not only of the book itself, but also of the world and the environment that created its context. Just as it would be hard to understand the purpose and the function of a windshield wiper outside the context of a car, it would be hard to understand Deuteronomy, especially in light of our theme. Deuteronomy and present truth, outside the context in which it arose. Notice here, it goes on to tell you about war and peace, 1,500 pages. And it says, someone had read that just in three days, and when asked what the book was about, the reader replied, it's about Russia. That's it. It's about Russia. Yeah, so we're going to be covering, it says here, in one week's lesson, thousands of years of history before we come to Deuteronomy is to do something like the same of what they've mentioned. Clifford Goldstein is the author this uh, time. Clifford Goldstein has been around for a long time. And uh, it says here at the bottom of the, the Book of the Covenant, Deuteronomy, there on page... Uh, uh, I think it's page three or so of your quarterly. It says he is the editor of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide and author of Baptizing the Devil, Evolution, and the Seduction of Christianity. Now well, that's a title for you, but that's what he's the author of. Before we get into the study, I want to take you over to page 12 and... I want you to read something there. I don't know how many of you recognize the person that's mentioned on page 12, but this gentleman is now a professor at Andrews, and he was a student of mine when I first started teaching at Indiana Academy. His name is John Peckham. And listen to this paragraph. By the way, uh, this book that he wrote was published by a non-Adventist press, and it shows, it goes on to tell you, uh, how good biblical scholarship can reveal the reality of the great controversy as depicted in Scripture. It says, in brief, I argue that God's love, properly understood, is at the center of a cosmic dispute and that God's commitment to love provides a morally sufficient reason for God's allowance of evil with significant ramifications for understanding divine providence as operating within what I call covenantal rules of engagement. And that's from page four of his book. And it goes on here, Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, the decree that Israel was not to enter Canaan for 40 years was a bitter disappointment to Moses and Aaron, Caleb and Joshua. Yet without a murmur, they accepted the divine decision, but those who had been complaining of God's dealings with them and declaring that they would return to Egypt wept and mourned greatly when the blessings which they had despised were taken from them. They had complained at nothing, and now God gave them cause to weep. Had they mourned for their sin when it was faithfully laid before them, this sentence would not have been pronounced. But they mourned for the judgment. Their sorrow was not repentance and could not secure a reversing of their sentence. That's from Patriarchs and Prophets. 
All right, let's turn to page seven. Love to be loved. Love to be loved. I don't think there's anyone in the congregation today that does not like to be loved. We love to have people love us, like us. And when you look at what happened here, what it's saying, and it refers to uh, the truth that God is love, helps us better understand the idea that God's government, how he rules all creation is reflective of that love. It permeates the cosmos, perhaps even more than gravity does. God loves us, and we, too, are to love God back in return. Notice the next paragraph. Love is freely given. There is no price to pay for love. God cannot force love. No one can be forced to love someone else. It just doesn't work that way. So let's look at some of the texts here that we have this morning. And Brent, let's start with you, please. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. Read those. And then uh, Nikki, Ezekiel 28, 12 through 17, please. And then Sue, Revelation 12, 7. Now, the question is, why do the following texts make sense only in the context of the freedom and the risk involved in love? Okay. What text was that again, Jesse? That's Ezekiel, I mean Isaiah, chapter 14, oh. verses 12 through 14. Is in 12? 14, 12 through 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn. You've been cut down to the earth. You've been weakened. You have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, I'm going to ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. I, and who's that talking? That's Lucifer. Lucifer, yeah. Been thrown out. Well, that wasn't enough. I'm going to still... Go back up there and I'm going to be on top. Be above the Most High. That was the last text that he read. Nikki? Ezekiel 28, 12 to 17. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onks, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers established you, I established you. You were on the, you were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I, I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Perfect. Created by perfect God, perfect being, chose otherwise. Sue. Revelation 12, 7, this controversy between God and the dragon began years ago in heaven. God's son, Michael, and the loyal angels fought against the dragon and his angels. They fought against the dragon and his angels. It's hard for us to understand 
perfection because we don't live in a perfect world. We don't live in a perfect state. But if you will, just kind of imagine in your mind right now. I don't know how many angels God created. I do know this, that we will replace, you know, when we go to heaven, we will be replacing some of those, those angels that fell, which, you know, it tells us there were a third of them that fell. But think about perfection. Think about a place where there's no shootings, murders, like it's going on right here in this neighborhood, not far from where we're standing today, where people love each other and none of this bad stuff exists. He was created, Lucifer was created by God, as we've just been reading here. Perfection. But there was something, and, and this is why we can't understand the mystery of sin. You know, I've, I already read that to you. So I'm not going to try to go down that road. It's hard to, to grasp that. But he made decisions, Lucifer did. And he wanted more. He wanted to be higher, as you've just read here from the Bible. He wanted to be higher than the most high. And of course, what came of that was, was conflict, war. I don't know what kind of war it was. Have no idea. Doesn't tell us exactly. But when it was all over with, we do know this, that a third of them fell. He deceived. He deceived. And notice that word I read that to you earlier from what I was reading. He deceived the angels. He deceived a third of them to go with him, to follow him. Mike? He deceived Eve. He didn't deceive Adam. No. Adam went into it with his eyes wide open. Right. He right. knew what he was doing. What I came up here about, uh, recently I sent Pastor Nix a quote from Ellen White. And I don't usually like to quote her because I'd much rather prove it in Scripture, where Satan not only is before God, and it says that in Revelation, he's the one who accuses our brothers and sisters day and night before God. But he's also still tempting other worlds. It's after, after Christ comes that he is bound to this earth for a thousand years, no longer to tempt anyone else. But right now, he's before God, Christ, Satan, before God the Father, accusing you, accusing me, accusing every one of us. Right. We know how stinky we are, but God knows even more, and Satan does too. I thank God the Father for Jesus Christ. Right. Because I right. have no other hope. Nope. It's not about this body. Paul, Paul called this body a clay jar. Clay jars break. They fall apart. You know, when archaeologists dig up things, they usually don't find whole pots. Mm -mm. Those clay jars are all broken. We're going to be broken and go to the grave. But who we really are, you know, the Greeks called it a soul, and there's always been confusion, but Christ said whatever we are, we sleep in the grave. And when he comes... We will hear his voice. Right. But so will the unredeemed the second time. Right. Yeah, they sure will. Well, let me share a couple of things from the companion book that's called E.G. White Notes. Go ahead, Juan. Uh, if you want... Uh, okay. What I was thinking is um, on the lesson and this week is... Uh, how helpful this lesson is for us that here many times of many people saying, why God allow evil? Why so many evil in the world? If God is love, if God is so powerful as he said he is, 
Why does he allow so many things happening? Things that are not close to be fair. Things that are horrible. And I think the lesson this week answered part of that question, or answered most of this question. It says, God loves to be loved, has to be free. And that's why uh, Lucifer is transformed to Satan. Because God created a being con with the capacity of disobeying the same God that has created him. Mm -hmm. And other beings, mm -hmm. like the many angels that you mentioned <clears throat> that follow the route, they probably, those who did not cross the line probably were tempted to do it. And they decided, no, I'm not, no, I'm not doing it to that side. I believe this is the right, the right place to be. And I believe God is right. And I think we are in the same position today. And I, to me, this lesson is so, so important for us. Because we, we, we hear that challenge to our belief very constantly with people. Why, if you believe in God, why all oh, this is happening? It's, God is not fair. Mm -hmm. Why does he allow all this? Mm -hmm. And I think we have a good answer in, uh, in just in the introduction of this lesson. Thank you. Yeah, no one, as I mentioned earlier, uh, can force you to love somebody. No one. And, uh, you know, in this story here, you know, the fall, uh, when it took place, he couldn't, uh, as Juan mentioned, we, we were created with the power of choice. And that's what was exercised here, was the power of choice. He chose, Lucifer chose consciously to do what he did. And as I mentioned earlier, when I was reading about the mystery of sin this morning, there is no excuse. If there was an excuse for sin, then it wouldn't be sin. It wouldn't exist. So there is no excuse. And so as we continue to read on here, we're going to find that this business of why we're, we were created, you know, in relationship to the love of God, and the choice that we have each day to either follow that love of God, and we love God in return, or we can go our own way, as many people in the world today are doing. But let me share the, with you this. It's on page six of the E.G. White Notes. <clears throat> it says one, two, it's about the third paragraph down. If it says, Christ has shown his great love for us by giving his life that we should not perish in our sins, that he might clothe us with his salvation. If this divine love is cherished in our hearts, it cements and strengthens our union with those of like faith. He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. It goes on to say, this union which joins heart with heart is not the result of sentimentalism, but the working of a healthful principle. Faith works by love and purifies the soul from all selfishness. Thus, the soul is perfected in love. And having found grace and mercy through Christ's precious blood, how can we fail to be tender and merciful? Notice what it says. And having found grace and mercy through Christ's precious blood, how can we fail to be tender and merciful? It says on the next page from the Desire of Ages, God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can cast a pebble to the earth. But he didn't do this. Rebellion was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. Now, think about that. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His authority rests upon goodness, mercy, and love, 
And the presentation of these principles is the means to be used. God's government is moral and truth and love are to be the prevailing power. That's a prevailing power. It's not a compelling power like Satan's government. Satan's government is a compelling power. Let's look at page 8. The fall and the flood. The fall and the flood. Let's look at Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. Dennis, if you want to read that, please. Go ahead, Lawrence. Jesse, I read that this week, and I thought to myself, as a father and a grandfather, I believe it's easier for God to deal with our rebellion. I can rebel out of ignorance. I think what hurts God the most is when we separate ourselves from God. Hmm. When you re- when you rebel, that's that's one that's one thing. Right. But when you separate yourself from God, that's rejection. Hmm. And that rejection is what hurts God more than anything. Yeah, saying that hey, I don't want anything Amen, to do with it. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Dennis, go ahead and uh, share with us from Genesis chapter 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. You know... uh, you and I know what death means. I don't know if Adam understood what death really meant until he saw the leaf fall from the tree, the first falling leaf. And as I read down a little farther, the next verse, and I, I may be confused here, but it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. Does that mean Adam was in the Garden of Eden before Eve was? So, and if we read the story a little farther, we we, uh, read about how Eve was uh, beguiled by the serpent, how the serpent lied to her. Eve did not know what lying was. Mm -hmm. You and I today know what lying is. We're hurt very much when someone that we trust and believe in lies to us. Mm -hmm. But here Eve was easily beguiled because she didn't know what lying was. And I agree with uh, Mike, uh, Satan, or, uh, Adam went in this thing with eyes wide open. <laughs> and uh, Eve, I don't think she did, only but, but now don't let me uh, stop there. They did have the companionship of holy angels, and those angels warned them about Satan and his deceptive ways. So I'm not making excuses for him. Uh, but I can see how easily she was beguiled. Yeah. Paul says, by one man's sin, Adam, all creation groaneth. Right. And is under right. the penalty of sin. Right. But one man, Jesus to Christ, we are delivered. Correct. My point to that is, he did. Paul didn't say, nor is I find anywhere in Scripture, it was Eve's sin that led us into bondage. Right. It was Adam's sin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. Thank and you'll you. notice also what um, Dennis read there, their instruction. And you've heard this many times you know, in your study. But there was one tree that they weren't to eat of. It wasn't a long list of things. It was just one thing. Don't eat of that particular tree. There wasn't, you know, all these other don'ts. It was just the one. Deborah, would you read um, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 for me? Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 7. And when you think about what Dennis read there from Genesis 2, 16 and 17... And, you know, here's your instructions. And as they pointed out, there were angels 
that were coming to them, talking to them, meeting with them, um, giving them that guidance. But, you know, the deception occurred, you know, in relationship to... And think about this. this what we know today as a serpent or a snake was nothing like what it was at that time. I mean, that was a beautiful creature. Beautiful creature. Deborah, go ahead, please. One through seven. <clears throat> One through seven? Yes, please. Okay. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. You know, when you read this, you shall not surely die. I can't help but think about in relationship to the things that we do to our bodies today. If a person smokes a cigarette, they don't drop dead. If they drink a beer, they don't drop dead. If they eat a high fatty meal, they're not dropping dead. But research will tell you that cigarettes will kill you and that alcohol can do away with your liver and that fatty meals can give you heart attacks and strokes and end it. And you see, in this situation here, in this deception, she didn't die. She took, ate the fruit, didn't die. And so by making that choice, and again, you know, I come back to, you know, the power of choice that all of us possess. She chose, and it didn't immediately happen. It's just like us, and I use food as an illustration because, you know, everybody's faced with that. And, you know, when we eat something that's not good for our bodies, we're not dying right then, but over a period of time, it will catch up with us. Juan? I know, but I, I kept on see, uh, thinking of about the order of seeing Eve was, uh, I mean, the, the, the serpent did the thing with Eve, and then Adam, he came with his wide, I don't I, I think I might say wide open. <laughs> uh, but I, I believe Adam's situation is not different than other situations or other people of the Bible. It's when we come to rationalize according to our thinking that we start singing, singing. Like, I, I imagine Adam thinking, how can I let go this wonderful woman, the most wonderful woman ever exists? I cannot let it go. I have to do it. He probably, there was probably a time when Adam was thinking, what am I going to do? 
she, she did wrong. I, 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 I'm not going to let her, <laughs> I'm not going to let it go. I have to do something. Instead of going to God and asking God, God, what should I do in this situation? He probably started thinking what he can do to solve this situation. And, and there, I think, is when we get in trouble. When instead of going to God, we, in our supposed intelligences, start thinking this is the best thing to do. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I agree with Lawrence wholeheartedly. You know, God, it's easy to forgive rebellion that's ignorance. But he forgives everything if we come to him. As Deborah read that, Satan said, you won't surely die. Majority of Christendom believes what, Jesse? When you die, are you dying? You won't surely no. die. Right, right. Now that's ignorance on a lot of people's part, although I believe there are some who know the truth and choose to ignore, <clears throat> embrace it. Mm -hmm. Also makes me wonder if we're going to go to heaven when we die, hey, hurry up and give me a heart attack. I want to come home. I'm tired of being here. <laughs> right. Right? Right. <laughs> No, everybody wants to hang on to every last bit of breath. But as Solomon said, you can't avoid that dark day. Right. And so, you know, and I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but we know the truth. You know, dead know nothing. Your plans cease to exist. The grave cannot praise you. Those are all verses in the Bible. And Jesus taught it was asleep. But what's the most important thing? Those who are in ignorance and believe something in ignorance, if they're believing in Jesus Christ as their Savior, God will show them, either in this world or after he resurrects them, mm -hmm. the truth. There will be many who have never heard the name of Jesus. Right, right. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of learning. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. I'm learning. Yeah. During that thousand years. <laughs> sure, there will be. There will be. Now let's take a look at the other part of this on page 8. We talk about the flood, or the fall. Now we're going to talk about the flood. Notice what it says there in that paragraph at the bottom. After the fall, things went from bad to worse. Even to the point where the Lord said about humanity. Now listen to this that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Continually. You think about that. There's approximately, if you read in the Bible, the, the generations, we're talking about 1,500 years. About 1,500 years. And you think about Adam lived to be 900 and some years, what he must have gone through each day, knowing that it was because of what he did that we have this situation we have now. But their thoughts were only evil continually. Noah preached for 120 years. He gets seven people to go in with him. And they're all his family. Seven people. Eight people. The world, as we know it, earth, was destroyed. Wiped out. And things are going to start all over. Very quickly, if you notice. If you notice Bible history... Very quickly, after the flood, as they repopulated, there's a group of people who got together and established the Tower of Babel. Because they said, hey, we're smart. We're not going to be destroyed by any 
flood. Uh-uh. We're ready this time. We're going to build this big building. And we're going to live in it. It's going to go up to the sky and we're going to be protected. And of course, after they started that project, that was the dispersion of people all over the world. He confused their language so they weren't all talking one language. That's what broke down the building of the Tower of Babel, too. Guy says, bring me what we would know as a hammer, and he brings a screwdriver. Well, that isn't going to go very far in, in that kind of a project. But that was all, you know, a God thing in relationship to dispersing other peoples. Well, on Tuesday's lesson on page 9, <clears throat> it talks about the call of Abram. The call of Abram. Ron, if you would, look up Genesis 12, verses 1, 2, and 3 for us. It says, looking back after the cross and after the death of Jesus and the spreading of the gospel, how do we understand what God was promising to do through Abram? What was he promising to do through Abram? Genesis chapter 12, 1, 2, and 3. Before he comes up, let me share this with you. It's on page 8 of E.G. White Notes. It's the 1, 2, 3rd paragraph, about over halfway through. It says, the Christian cannot always be in the position of prayer, but, but his thoughts and desires can always be upward. Our self-confidence would vanish. Did we talk less and pray more? That's something to think about. Our self-confidence would vanish if we talked less and prayed more. Ron, go ahead, please. Genesis 12, 1, 2, 3. Now, now the Lord uh, had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Uh, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Staying with the E.G. White Notes, bottom of page 8. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. He didn't know where he was going. Didn't have a road map. Didn't have any idea where he was heading to. And so it goes on to say, So, to the Apostle Paul, praying in the temple at Jerusalem, came the message from God, Depart, for I will send thee... Far hence unto the Gentiles. So those who are called to unite with Christ must leave all in order to follow him. Old associations must be broken up, plans of life relinquished, earthly hopes surrendered, in toil and tears, in solitude, and through sacrifice must the seed be sown. Laboring for the salvation of the soul is employment worthy of the highest honor. Laboring for the salvation of the soul is employment worthy of the highest honor. It matters not what may be the form of our labor or among what class, whether it's high or low. In God's sight, these distinctions will not affect its true worth. The sincere, earnest, contrite soul, however ignorant, is precious in the sight of the Lord. No matter how ignorant, it is precious in the sight of the Lord. He places his own signet upon men, judging not by their rank, not by their wealth, not by their intellectual greatness. Did you catch that? Not by their rank, not by their wealth, not by their intellectual greatness, but by their oneness with Christ. By their oneness with Christ. You know, when you look at Abram and what 
this meant. It meant packing up everything he had and going on the road. Leaving his father, as it says there in what he read. And he's packing up everything, not knowing where he's going to end up. But by faith, by faith, he heard the call and moved on. Yes, Mike. Can you imagine that conversation between Abram and Sarai? Hmm. Yeah. Hey, we're going to move today. Yeah. Where are we going? I don't know. Don't know. Right. What do you mean you don't know? You, you're supposed to know what we're doing. God told me, who's God? You know, there in the very beginning of this story with Abram, which later, it was after Ishmael, he got renamed to Abraham. He didn't perfectly follow God's instructions. Right. What a story of grace right there at the beginning. He was told to leave his father's house, yet he took his nephew... He didn't leave him behind. And, and it's not important why. I mean, I'm sure his heart bled for him because his nephew's dad had died, his Abram's brother. But if you study the scripture of that, God didn't, and I believe God spoke audibly to Abraham. God didn't speak to him again to Lot and he separated. But God still carried him. Sure. Still directed him where to go. Each right. day, I'm sure he got up, made his sacrifice, and knew within him where to go. Right. So there's grace right there in the beginning of that story. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's take a look at uh, page 10. The covenant at Sinai. The covenant at Sinai. And... It talks about the Exodus, and it talks about what happened at the Red Sea, and it talks about these things that are going on and taking place, and it goes on to say, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. That's Exodus 19.4. And when you look at this, you know, the question is, why did the Lord call the people out from Egypt? Exodus 19, 4 through 8. Kathy, you want to read that, please? Exodus 19, 4 through 8. Why did the Lord call the people out from Egypt? Why were they called out from Egypt? Okay. 19, 4 through 8. Mm-hmm. You saw what I, the Lord, did to the Egyptians and how gently I carried you along, as gently as a mother eagle carries her young on her wings, and I brought you all the way here to meet with me. If you will obey me and keep my commandments, <clears throat> then out of all the nations on earth, you will continue to be my treasured possession. The whole world is mine, but you will be a special people to carry out my mission. You will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, committed to me alone. So Moses went back down, called the leaders of the people together and told them everything the Lord had said and what he expected them to do. The elders responded enthusiastically, we will do what the Lord says and gladly accept him as our king. Moses went back up to the mountain and took their answer to the Lord. Is that it? Came back, went back up to the mountain, took their answer to the Lord. Now, when you look at this, on page 10 of the E.G. White Notes, it's the first full paragraph. If the Israelites had obeyed God's requirements, they would have been practical Christians. They would have been happy, for they would have been keeping God's ways and not following the inclinations of their own natural hearts. Moses did not leave them to misconstrue the words of the Lord or to misapply his requirements. He wrote all the words of the Lord in a book that they might be referred to afterward. And in the mount, he had written them as Christ himself dictated them. It goes on to say, 
that bravely did the Israelites speak the words promising obedience to the Lord. After hearing the covenant read in the uh, audience of the people, they said, all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. Then the people were set apart and sealed to God. A sacrifice was offered to the Lord, and a portion of the blood of the sacrifice was sprinkled on the altar. This signified that the people had consecrated themselves, body, mind, and soul, to God. A portion was sprinkled upon the people. This signified that through the sprinkled blood of Christ, God graciously accepted them as his special treasure. As his special treasure. They were a special people. They were a peculiar people. They were to give a message to the neighboring countries. They were not to be inclusive. They were to spread the message about the Lord to other nations. They were to be a great nation because of what they were doing in relationship to the salvation of other souls. That's what their purpose was. It was not to be an isolated community where they would take everything they could take for themselves and get wealthier and wealthier. They were to spread it with others around. That was what they were to be doing. And that is the same thing for us today as Seventh-day Adventist Christians is to be spreading the message with others around us. Spreading that message. And uh, Mike? You know, we started off in Deuteronomy. and I'd like to go back there. What I find in the Old Testament, I can find a verse complementing it in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. I'm reading in Deuteronomy 30, starting at verse 4. Though you are scattered to the ends of the earth, the Lord your God will go and find you and bring you back again. What he's talking about is he warned them that they would become a stiff-necked, stubborn people and disobey him, and eventually he would have to punish them and scatter them, and many of them would die. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart. You spoke of circumcision in the beginning. Right. And the hearts of your descendants, so you will love him with all your heart, soul, so that you may live. Over in Colossians, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by physical procedure. It was a spiritual procedure, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. We have to approach Christ but we, and ask for forgiveness. Right. But there's God's promise. He will circumcise. In the New Living Testament, it says cleanse. King James Version, it uses the word circumcise. So he will cleanse us from this. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Apostasy and punishment on page 11 um, Lawrence, would you turn to Exodus 19, read verses 4 and 5 for me, please? Exodus 19, 4 and 5, it says, What was the crucial component for Israel in regard to the covenant? Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore... If ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. For all the earth is mine. You're going to be a peculiar people if you obey and listen to this voice. Now, you know, you go back to the fall. There was given one thing not to do. Don't eat of that particular tree. Here, they've agreed they made the covenant. They agreed to do what he said. Moses went back up to the mountain and told the Lord they agreed to keep. Now, in relationship to this, what he just read, he says, you saw what I did to the Egyptians, how I brought you out of there. You, you've seen this. And if you, as he goes on here in verse 5, 
if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine. Above all the people, all the earth is mine. Well, it tells you here in that paragraph after what he just read there out of Exodus 19, 4 and 5, it says, it goes on to tell you, the call to obey God to keep his law was no more legalism than it is now. You know, a lot of people talk about um, legalism, legalistic. Well, when you look at this call that he just made, the parallel they're using is between this call and where we are today. It's not legalistic to keep the Ten Commandments. You keep the Ten Commandments because God is love. Ten Commandments were not given to punish. They were given because God is love. And you go down through those ten and you think about them this morning. They are not, thou shalt not do this. It's a situation where he knew that if you were committing adultery, that isn't love. If you're stealing from somebody, that isn't love. If you're using uh, foul language and cursing, that isn't love. If you are putting your honor to other gods besides the God of heaven and earth, that isn't love. If you're not obeying your parents, that isn't love. If you are not keeping the seventh day as a Sabbath, that isn't love. Because that's what he has asked us to do in this love relationship. And that's why this is all so important in relation to understanding where we are in our study here. Yes. The, the difference is, do we think by obeying the commandments <clears throat> that saves us? Yes, Jesus said, if you love me, keep, keep my, my commandments. commandments. Right. But none of us can keep them. Jesus taught, if you think of a woman in your heart, <laughs> our heads, we've already committed adultery. Mm -hmm. So we can think and it be sin. <clears throat> I struggle with an anger issue. Lord and I have worked on this <laughs> all my life. Anger is not love. But my point is, Jesus saves us. And out of that, our thankfulness should be, Lord, I'm going to do to the best of my ability right. what you have already told us to do. I can't do it in my own power. But you have promised, with every temptation, a way of deliverance. To, to do it. Right. Right. I want to share this with you on page 11. The last paragraph there on page 11. God desires his people to prepare for the soon coming crises. Now this is from a book called Acts of the Apostles, which was written back in the 18, late 1800s. Prepared or unprepared, they must all meet it, and those only who have brought their lives into conformity to the divine standard will stand firm at that time of test and trial. When secular rulers unite with ministers of religion to dictate in matters of conscience, then it will be seen who really fear and serve God. When the darkness is deepest and the light of a godlike character will shine the brightest, when every other trust fails, then it will be seen who have an abiding trust in Jehovah. And while the enemies of truth are on every side watching the Lord's servants for evil, God will watch over them for good. He will be to them as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Like a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. That's what it is all about here in relationship to the soon coming crises. And folks, as I said, that was written in the 1880s, 1890s when she wrote the book, The Acts of the Apostles. Here we are in 2021, and she's talking about the soon coming crises 
prepared or unprepared. Folks, we're in the crises now. The crises is all around. When ministers of religion dictate in matters of conscience, and then it will be seen only who really fear and serve God. All of these things are going on. They're going on in different parts of the world today as we're here this morning. Things are, the crisis is there, and it is, it is happening. At this time, we're going to take up the offering. And uh, the offering this time, if you look on the back of your study guide, it tells you it's the Northern Asia Pacific. The Northern Asia Pacific is where the offering is this time. And there's different projects listed there. And Dennis will come around now with the uh, basket to collect your monies uh, for the missions uh, that we have. And now we're ready for the film, if you would please, for the mission spotlight today. who have not heard the gospel message. Reaching these vast cities seems daunting, and the work in sensitive territories is even more difficult to measure. Not even 1% of the 230 million people in the Northern Asia Pacific region are Seventh-day Adventists. Despite the challenges, Adventists pray for opportunities to share the light of Jesus in this territory. The Adventist Church in Japan invited the General Conference and the Northern Asia Pacific Division to partner with them to create Mission Unusual, a massive church planting and disciple making movement. Since Tokyo is the world's largest city, this movement is an ambitious effort. Working closely with local Japanese church leaders, a team of church planting missionaries is on the ground, learning the language and deciding how best to share Jesus with the Japanese. The three missionary couples spend hours each day preparing themselves for the work within central Tokyo. It's not just the population size that makes outreach hard. There are many barriers to religion too. The Japanese society is largely secular, and many people adhere to Eastern philosophy. Another challenge is overcoming the isolation of the older generation. Reaching out to them and showing them compassion can be tricky. Missionaries like Yuri and Lais have been creating connections with their neighbors. Simple tasks like shopping, visiting the local park, and practicing their growing Japanese vocabulary with strangers on the street are all opportunities to connect. The missionary team gathers each Sabbath to pray, study God's word, eat, laugh, share challenges, and seek the Holy Spirit together. Aya is a great example of a local church member who has taken the spirit of mission unusual to heart. She uses her home as a place of ministry, especially for parents and kids. Some have been introduced to the Bible for the first time in her living room. Others have even requested prayer for their families. Amazing things are happening in Tokyo. With time, the ministry team will grow as plans are made to bring in global mission pioneers, urban centers of influence, volunteers, and tent makers in the future. The challenge of ministering to the world's largest city can sometimes seem like too much but God's power can overcome all barriers. We ask that you continue to pray for the Mission Unusual Church Planting and Disciple Making Movement. Pray that the Adventists here will continue to develop new creative ways to build connections with those around them. Thank you for supporting the mission offering, which fuels work like this. The hills around Unlan Batar, Mongolia are covered in brightly colored houses and traditional yurts. A Mongolian yurt is a type of elaborate, semi-permanent tent. The concept has been used for many generations. Assembling and disassembling a yurt takes only a few hours. They may not seem like they would be very sturdy, but yurts can withstand even the worst storms. In some areas of Mongolia, yurts are used as places of worship. It's a perfect space to keep warm during the cold winter months. Bono is Adra Mongolia's chief accountant. She uses her yurt home to host Mongolia's only Pathfinder Club and a small congregation. Bono and her husband, Boomchen, planted this church as global mission pioneers several years ago. 
they wanted to create a better community for their own kids among the neighborhood children. Bono started a Bible story time, which quickly became popular with both the children and the adults because of her enthusiasm, creativity, and wonderful storytelling. They used to attend the main Adventist church in the city. As the neighborhood children became more involved in their lives, Bono and Boomchen took them along. That soon became a problem because the car could only fit so many children. The solution they decided was to start a Sabbath school in their yurt home. The weekly services were well attended, with parents often accompanying their children. This led to a growing Pathfinder club, and then to church services. They are a model church planting team, connecting with their community in positive ways, meeting people's needs, and then inviting them to accept Jesus as their Savior. The people are responding, and the church is growing in Mongolia. Since they started church planting in their neighborhood, dozens of community members have accepted Jesus into their hearts and have been baptized. Please pray for the work in this country in the 1040 window. Pray for global mission pioneers like Bono and Boomchin, who connect with their communities in creative ways and share a message of hope. You can support the work of global mission pioneers by donating on the global mission website. Thank you for supporting Mission. Good morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. Glad you're with us. If you're visiting, we're glad you're with us too. But it's good to see you all here. You know, when we look at the work that we have to do, there is no need for anyone to be not busy because we have a lot of work to do. A lot of things out there to help people with. A lot of things going on in our community to become involved with. And those of you that are involved with our Neighbors in Need program, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who are involved in our other programs, your uh, AA meetings, your NA meetings, your uh, other uh, ministry that we have that Martha's working with, with the uh, Strip Love. A lot of things going on and happening here to keep us busy. I want to share this with you. I found this this week in reading. It comes from a book called Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 35 and 36. It says, salt must be mingled with the substance to which it is added. It must penetrate and infuse in order to preserve. You know, what we're saying here is if you just pour the salt on and it doesn't penetrate, penetrate in there, it's not going to do anything. You know, if you just put salt on green beans, let's say, on your plate, and then you go and eat those green beans, the only salt is right there on the very top. It's not penetrating down. So it's not really doing what you want it to do because you want all of your food to be salted, all those green beans. So it goes on to say it is through personal contact and association that men are reached by the saving power of the gospel. Men are reached by the saving power of the gospel through personal contact. goes on to say, 
they are not saved in masses, but as individuals. Personal influence is a power. Personal influence is a power. We must come close to those whom we desire to benefit. We must come close to those whom we desire to benefit. You see, if we take the position and say, well, yeah, I'll send a few dollars to take care of that. I'll send a few dollars over there to take care of that. Well, I'm not saying we don't need the money. I'm not saying that. But if that's the only position that you take, then it's really not helping us here because it says we must come close to those whom we desire to benefit. You see, passing out meals is not just about giving out food. It goes deeper than that. It goes deeper in relationship to getting acquainted with folks out there that need human touch. They need human beings to talk to them and, and treat them in a Christian manner. That's what it's all about. And we're finding that the Lord is really blessing this work. There are many people that are individuals that we are coming in contact with, helping them, like I said, not just from a physical standpoint, but also from a spiritual standpoint in working with folks. Shelton? Yeah, the homeless, those that are less fortunate. Right. Right, 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 right. Yep. Yeah. Right. And you know, it's, it is, and it's, it's also in relationship to what I spoke about earlier this morning. It's not by rank or wealth or intellectual uh, properties that we may exist that God looks at. He looks at the heart and he looks at where these people are as you just mentioned there Shelton about the the person that didn't have that big education who was not a real educated person but had the love for for Jesus Christ and that's what I wanted to share with you all this morning on how important this is in being having to mingle having to you don't have to do anything but that's right. Yeah, it is. Within their heart to want to... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I thank you for all those good comments, Shelton. It's good to see you here this morning. We'll put him on the prayer list. Yeah, we'll put him on the prayer list. We sure will. We'll put him on there. Go ahead, Juan. Okay. Sure.
sure. Sure. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that's the challenge. What's that, Shelton? Right. Well, right, right. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Thank you. No, no. You're doing the right thing. Thank you, and it's good to see you here this morning. Appreciate all the rest of you, the things that you're doing. Uh, may God bless all of us. Give us a good week, good afternoon as we go out and meet with people this afternoon. Thank you. Hey, what a No, you. Who is the player? What's that? Smile. Smile. Yeah, I know. See? Yeah, I hear you. Happy Sabbath. We're going to begin today's um, uh, song service singing number 53 from He Is Our Song, Jesus, Name Above All Names. And we're going to sing it twice. Jesus, Name Above All Names, Beautiful Savior.
I did choose some short songs today, so we're also going to repeat the next one, Open Our Eyes. Sabbath day, as we look up to you today and worship, make our joy complete, Lord, to look down upon us and bless us, be in your will, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.
Praise the Lord. Happy Sabbath. Look forward to them each week, don't you? You know, uh, I turn the news on each week and listen to all the things that are going on. Sabbath, forget those things. I come and I worship. What a joy it is. I'd like for you to take your bulletins and read them. Read all the announcements in them, okay? But I do want to mention a couple. By the way, number one is there will be Sabbath school and church here next Sabbath. I know that there's alumni over at the academy, but uh, there'll be some of us over there, but we're still going to have church and Sabbath school here at Anderson. Uh, Remember the meetings that are going on out at Cross Street Christian School? we got three more weeks of them, and uh, it's a little different format out there, and I enjoy it. We have tables that we can sit at. You can take your Bibles and study and follow along, and you also get a lesson study for the evening's topic. So we encourage you to come out and to bring a visitor with you. I want to mention for the first reading for transfers. The following names to the Anderson Seventh-day Adventist Church. We got Peter and Melissa Cousins, their children, Andrew, Anna, and Arian. And also transferring into Anderson are David and Kim Dickerson. And Madonna Moore. Anybody know who she is? <laughs> and Madonna, or Rachel Moore. These names will have their second reading uh, maybe next week or in two weeks. Also transferring out of the Anderson Church to the Cicero Church for the first reading is Brandon and Diana Kane. Okay, also uh, we mentioned the alumni is coming up next Sabbath. And a week after that is a real treat. And on Sabbath afternoon out at the school, at the church school, now, does anybody know Jimmy Woods? Yes. Remember, he's been here before, and he's worked with our students and has had a student choir. So I'm looking forward. What's that? I said I know Tiger Woods. Yeah, I know him too. But they're, no, they're not related to each other. Uh, so uh, in two weeks, you're going to have a special. That's... Uh, uh, October the 16th, the hymn festival with Jimmy Woods out to Cross Street Christian School. For other information, please, please read your bulletin. Uh, you can look over the prayer list. I want to mention this. Our church lost a good friend this week. Amen. We only got to know her for a short time. And that's Joanna Hayes. It seems like Joanna... Went fast. It wasn't that long ago that she was here at church. I know she enjoyed coming to church here. She looked forward to Jesse to her Sabbath school class. And she enjoyed prayer meetings. So I know her family's going to miss her. and We need to remember them and our prayers this coming week. That's the family of Joanna Hayes. And I know if I can remain faithful, I will see Joanna in God's kingdom. There are other names on the list that you also want to remember. And this morning, friends, uh, because of the time, I know there's a number of requests. How many have prayer requests this morning? God sees your hands and he knows what those requests are. And he will answer your request.
You know, I pray the same prayer. Does anybody else pray that prayer too? Yes, we, we need to have patience, don't we? Okay. We'll remember you, Bradley. Okay? We will. God knows. He knows. All right, for our scripture reading this morning, I'd like for you to turn to Second Chronicles chapter 30. Verse 8. Second Chronicles 30, verse 8. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. I'm going to invite you this morning, friends, you have a burden on your heart to bring it to the altar. Let's go to our knees in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this morning, Father, with broken hearts, some of us. Some of us have burdens on our hearts for friends. I ask that you remember those today, Father, are less fortunate than we are. That you be close to them. You saw the hands raised this morning, Lord, of those who have special requests and prayer for loved ones and friends and neighbors. We pray for those souls. You know what those requests are, Lord. Some may be sick and are suffering. I pray for healing for them, if it be thy will. Remember those of the morning, the loss of loved ones, and we ask that you remember Joanne Hayes' family as they mourn her loss. We're thankful for the hope that we have within us, Lord. The world has no hope, but we have hope through your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray our lives, Father, can be a mirror of Jesus in us, that when others see us, they'll see Christ. Help us to be like Christ, that we can be kind, gentle, honest, trustworthy, patient, loving and forgiving towards all. Lord, we believe Jesus is coming soon. May we be ready. Use each one of us as a tool in your hand in helping to finish that work. Maybe it's just a kind word or a life of Christ-likeness a silent life, Lord. May we be a witness for you some way, somehow. We ask that you pour your Holy Spirit out upon us, your people, Lord. 
May this work soon be finished. And we can go home and live with you in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, the offering is for the local budget, church budget. I might mention to you, you know, we got off of a, a habit in relationship to the helping hand uh, offering. And so um, we'll, we'll collect that probably about three weeks from today. We used to do it the first Sabbath of the month, and then we had, you know, all the COVID and everything. So uh, we'll try to get back into the swing of that, but three weeks from today, we'll, we'll uh, do that again, uh, get it going. And what we'll do is we'll take it up during the uh, personal ministries time is what we'll do. So in the meantime, those of you that want to help support that program, feel free to do that. Just put helping hand down on the uh, uh, tithe envelope and it'll be taken care of and sent to the right place. And we appreciate all of you helping that program because it is really the funds are coming in and things are going in the right direction there with that. Now, in looking at the church budget here, uh, right now at this point, things are not going in the correct direction. But because uh, you can see there's a $3,3100 deficit in relationship to our budget. So if you can remember to be very uh, faithful uh, with that, we would appreciate that greatly uh, in reference to that because the church budget, it just doesn't take care of the lights and so forth here, but it also takes care of the school. There's a, a big, uh, significant amount of money each month that goes uh, to the school from the church to help it continue its operations. But the Lord is blessing, the Lord is blessing in many ways, in many ways to our church. The Lord is blessing individuals who um, are giving, um, those that aren't giving. Everyone is being blessed uh, if you're working for Jesus. There's no doubt about it out there in the everyday world, the people that you come in contact with. So let us be very liberal this morning with our tithes and offerings, and at this time the deacons will stand for prayer. Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be together here this morning. Lord, we pray that you will continue to bless the blessings of life, of health, the blessings that we are able to return our tithe to you, return offerings to you, and we pray that you will continue to be with us. And our church here and the impact that we have in our community and also with our school, we pray that you will continue to be with uh, the teachers and those that are working with the school directly, that things will go well for them, and that uh, they'll have a good school year. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
this time, can we have our children come forward? Let them come, let them come, let the children come to me. I have time, I have time, said the Savior tenderly. Let them come, let them come, please don't turn them away. I have time, let them come, let them stay. Oh, yeah. Oh, there you go. Well, you guys pray for me because the Lord woke me like at 2 o'clock in the morning and gave me um, my story, kind of. So I kind of have my story here. I'm not sure how it's going to end. Okay, you guys, tell me. What is it? A potato. Kind of an old one, but it's a potato. Now, does your mom make anything with a potato? No? Huh? Peel it. Well, yeah, you peel it. What does your mom make with a potato? She made a potato bar. A potato bar? That sounds good. Does your make mom make anything with a potato? Kirsten. Kirsten, go ask mommy what she makes with a potato. Hurry. A potato patty. Come here. Let's sit down. French fries. Do any of you guys like French fries? Some, some mommies make mashed potatoes with gravy. Does anybody like that? Or a baked potato. So baked potatoes, they have a purpose, you know. But, do you, here, what does that say? Uh, sour, cream. sour cream potatoes. Can I make French fries with this? No. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Could I make a baked potato with this? I don't think so. So uh, what I need... A real potato to do the job. And like mashed up, I can't get it back to its original. That's smart. I can't get it back to its original. But, yes, Amelia? I makes dinner. She makes dinner? Oh, she's a good mom. So, so the thing is... We want to be real Christians. We don't want to be pretend Christians. Does that work? Okay. We want to be Christians that God can use to do all the things that he calls us to, not be fake Christians like fake mashed potatoes can't make French fries. Fake mashed potatoes? But but they can make fake French or not well not that bad it can't. So we we want to do that. We want to try to be as good Christians as we can. We don't want to play just safe. Okay. So let's have a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, we just thank you that these children are learning the things that you want them to know, so that they can grow up and be healthy Christians that can do your work. And we praise you and thank you. Amen. Now go collect the lamb's offering, please. Yeah, you can. Go give it to her.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. The song I'm going to sing for you today goes along with our community service. I especially think it goes along with what our Sabbath school lesson was about. It talks about people needing the Lord. And it's up to us as fellow Christians to be able to share that with others. We have the privilege of being used by God to do that. It isn't because God needs us to. It isn't because God needs our money. It isn't because God needs our hours and our time. It's because it's our privilege and a blessing to be able to do that. And we are blessed because we can bless others. People need the Lord. Every day they pass me by I can see it in their eyes Empty people filled with care Headed who knows where On they go through private pain Living fear to fear their silent cries only Jesus hears people need the Lord people need the Lord at the end of broken dreams he's the sermon right there. Happy Sabbath. Well, we're going to, as I say, I, I never have a sermon, but something to think about maybe as we try and draw close to the Lord and ask Him to impress on us what thoughts we can have for the day. I was going to title my
talk today is yielding. You know, I grew up with many, many blessings, just one after another. Some I took advantage of and some I didn't. One of them, I think, is, you know, it's, you can immediately recognize sometimes when you want to yield. You know, I grew up, I think about my father-in-law, passed away, now Robert. You know, it was easy to understand that he was older, wiser, had a lot of wisdom, a lot more experience. And so you think, hey, Robert, what do you think we ought to do here? And that was a question he got a lot of times. Hey, Robert, what do you think we ought to do? Both from people like me, the church, different groups. What do you think we ought to do? Because it was recognized he had a lot of experience, a lot of wisdom, a lot of knowledge. And he loved you. And he wanted to see you do the right thing. So it was easy to see that. How much more with Christ? How much more wisdom, experience, knowledge, and love would anyone have than Christ? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather here today. A holy Sabbath day. You've given us the whole day off. Given us choices here that we can come together and worship and praise, adoration to you, fellowship with each other. Thank you for this blessing, Lord. As we lift you up, let us be drawn to you and your love. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't have too many new ideas, so I always pick up on something I've heard and when Mr. Cousins was here a month or so ago and was speaking, he left off. The last thing he was talking about was yielding. People who wouldn't yield. And he talked about Judas. You know, the thing was, Judas, he wasn't going to yield. And so I'm going, that gave me an idea. And I thought, well, I'll just pick up on that thought and uh, go with a few places with that and see if it resonates with you and some thoughts you might have. You know, what was the problem there with Judas? I mean, he was with Christ. So what was the problem? Well, you know, his mind, think about this, was on earthly glory. He thought, I know that Jesus, I've been around him for three and a half years. I know that he's wise. I know he's powerful. And I really believe he's the Son of God. You know what? He'll never be taken. They're not, he's not going to allow with the power and the glory that I've seen him exhibit. He's not going to let the world take him over. He's going to manifest himself, become king, and you know, who is in a better place to capitalize on that but me? You know, when he becomes king, who's he going to look to to uh, share that power and glory with? But, of course, the people who were closest to him on this earth, his disciples, and you know, I was the treasure. I might wind up being treasure of the whole world. <laughs> And you can see his mind was caught up in earthly glory. And when he realized that he had betrayed God and it was in God's own son who had came here to give his life for him and realized he had betrayed him and really had no interest in what Jesus had to offer because he was not going to receive worldly glory. And that's where we left off. Instead of yielding, he committed suicide. Well, this is the main question we have in life as we look at Christ and we say, are we going to yield? See that, you know, that triangular sign you see out on the highway? It says this way and that way, yield. Yield to somebody coming on, you know. Do we like that? Do we like to yield? You know, and and a lot of times in traffic situations, like it'll say, well, stop. Well, you know, it's your turn to stop, four-way stop or stop light. Tell me, how's that going to work out if we don't? It's not going to work out too well, is it? You know, confusion. Well, so how much more it is with God. If we don't yield, what do we wind up with? Well, I suggest just look around the world today. This is what we wind up with. You know, when we don't yield, we wind up with kind of the way the world is now, the way the world world was at the flood, and God destroyed all of it except for those few people in the ark was because they wouldn't yield. We see what it amounts to. Let's take a look at Romans 6, verse 19. Romans 6, if you would, turn in your Bible. Romans 6, verse 19. Acts, Romans. So, we take a look here at Romans 6. I'm sorry, Romans 6, verse 19, not 13. Romans 6, verse 19. I am speaking in human terms, Paul says, because of the weakness of our flesh. 
Just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification or holiness. You know, we see that everyone is going to be a slave. And it's, it's unfortunate we have to think that way, but, but it's the truth, you know. We do not have the power to control our lives. We have the power. God has given us this much power. We can turn it over to Christ, or we can turn it over to Satan, but we don't have the power to set our own. We're not our own creator. We're not our own navigator. We don't have the power to decide what's right and wrong, and to set a good course. You know, we can only put our lot in with Christ and he can do that. Or we can put it in with Satan and, you know, we can see what that looks like. You know, Paul went on to say, when he talks about these things that control us, we groan under the load of sin. The earth groans under it. Here's a little article that talks about that. I'm just going to read a short part of it from Margos Pazaghi of Adventist World. Humans are to blame. Twenty centuries ago, Apostle Paul penned a statement as current as our latest news feed. He wrote, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. With a simple but powerful analogy, Paul places the groans of creation within the continuum of the plan of salvation. Creation subjected to fertility, not willing is now groaning, waiting to be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Well, where did this bondage of corruption come from, you know? It, uh, when we give our lives over to things of this world, the love of money, not money, but the love of money, the love of power, fame, and so forth, you know, it's kind of easy to think, you know, I could take care of the discharge from my plant but that would cost me an extra 100000 or $100 million a year, and I just don't think I can make it if I do that. So it's better to dump this stuff out on the ground. You know, we could make power if we didn't, uh, and, and make it in a clean and organized way and, and not have to pollute, but, you know, we couldn't make any money doing that. So we better, I'm not here just to talk about conservation and these things, but... God says to conserve the earth, to be good stewards. You know, I always take a glass of water when I talk to some people. I take a little glass of water. And say, you want a glass of water? Oh, yeah. You know, and I get a teaspoonful of dirt and I put in there and then I mix it up. Here you go. What are you? Are you nuts? Why'd you put that teaspoonful of dirt in that glass of water? I say, well, just how much pollution do you want in your water? I don't want any. Well, then why do we have polluted water? If you don't want any. You know, if I set off a smoke bomb in the office and said, now we're just going to sit here and work. Well, are you crazy? Open the windows. Get that out of here. But how much pollution do we want in the air? Air pollution is one of the number one killers, you know, particularly in industrialized countries like China. That For some years, China has been opening a, a cold fire power plant every other week. That's right, I said every other week, 26 of them a year, every other week a new coal-fired power plant goes up. We're just pumping, you know, that has a lot of mercury, a lot of lead, a lot of things that are in coal in those minerals. And when it rains, it just comes down to earth. And, you know, if you was to go to Beijing on an ordinary day, you'd have to wear a mask. You So I don't like to wear a mask. You can't make me wear one. Okay, if you were in Beijing, you'd want to wear one. <laughs> Why is that? Because you can hardly see from here to the other end of the church. Why is that? Because we're making so much electricity with that coal. There's so much pollution you can't hardly see. And my point is, you know, do we yield and say, well, that's not right? Or do we say, well, that's the way it is because I need to make some money on that. Well, a few thoughts there about when we, uh, what I'm trying to portray here is our habits, you know. I, I've got a lot of habits. Some of them are even good. Some of them may be not so good. But I've got habits, and I tend to fall into that line when I do something. It's my wife shaking her head, oh, yeah. He does the same thing every day. 
You know, and it is. We have a habit. I get up at the same time. I eat the same thing for breakfast. I go to work at the same time. It's habit forming to do the same thing all the time. What's your habit? If it's your habit when you're confronted to become angry, that's what you do. Why is that? Because that's my habit to do that. If it's your habit to become confrontational, that's generally what you do. If it's your habit to stop, and not say anything, that's what you're going to tend to do. You know, whatever your habit is, you fall back on. When you're pressed, especially when you're pressed hard, that's what you fall back to. You know, if our habit is to talk to the Lord and say, oh man, I am just need to talk to you today. If that's our habit, we find ourselves doing it every day. Many times a day, if that's our habit. You know, if it's not, we find out, and we see this particularly in the world around us, we find people trying to find answers to their questions in many different ways, hundreds of ways that are meaningless because it's their habit to do that. So we're trying to see and talk about this habit of yielding to Christ. You know, everything is centered around Christ. One time, nearly 40 years ago, and I think it was a thing of the Holy Spirit, I was certainly not living a God-filled life, but I've been reading a lot about Indians and a lot about American Indians and a lot about different tribes on the plain that always interested me. Indian tribes who lived out on the plain in different places and their, their habits, their customs, their way of dealing with life and with each other. And you know, some of it is, t- and some tribes were very peaceable and very loving and very caring and nurturing to themselves, their families, and those around them. And some of them were very warlike and cruelty beyond imagination. And we've all read those stories. And I was talking with someone I knew, Charles, <clears throat> not Charles Allen, but Charles, good, devoted man. And I just said to him, Charles, I just read these stories about the American Indian tribes, and I just can't under, I can't get my hand around it. I can't grasp it, you know. It just seems like, to me, I said, all of a sudden, it just seems like that what defined them was their view on God. I don't know why I said that, but I just said it. I just said, it just seems like what defines each one of those tribes is the way they viewed God. And Charles looked at me and he said, and so it does with all of us. And it kind of woke me up. That four years ago never left me. That always stuck in my mind. And so it is with all of us. Our view of God, you know, I like to point that out with somebody else. Hey, Mr. Smith, your view of God's defining you. Well, it's good to point that out for somebody else, but what about me? Well, yeah, it's defining me too. Every one of us is our view of God. You know, the closer we get to the Lord, the more decisions we have to make of whether we're going to yield or not. When we're not close to the Lord and we're far away, we don't see many to, I don't know, I'm just doing this, I'm doing that, I'm going to work. I'm running around here and there. I'm doing this and that. I'm busy. Can't you see that? And you know, we don't think too much or think we have too many decisions. But the closer we decide that we want to walk with the Lord, the Lord impresses us. There's many more decisions of yielding we need to make. You know, I'd like to do this, but wait a minute. Let me talk to Christ. You know, I'd like to eat this. I'd like to think this. I'd like to talk about this. I'd like to go here. I'd like to whatever. You know, but I think I better talk about Christ, to talk to Christ about this. And he says, you know, that's good, but there's a better way. And the question is, am I going to yield or am I going to do what I want to do? You know, I'd really like to do this. I don't like you. So I'd really like to hold a grudge against you. But I better talk to Christ about that. Because Christ would say, you know, well, you're a little unlikable yourself. And it would be easy not to like you. But I love you. I love you so much. I want to see you in the kingdom with me. And I'm willing to go to any lengths that I can live with you forever. Now do we feel that way about other people? Everyone? I always like to go to the Will Rogers Museum out in Oklahoma. And see he he had a lot of folksisms and wit, witty saying, sayings, you know, he added, but one of them stuck out more than others to this day. And he said, I never met a man I didn't like. How about that? I never met a man I didn't like. So in other words, what Will Rogers was saying, a humorist of back in the 20s and 30s of the last century, he didn't say, I never met someone who was doing things 
I didn't like, or like, that's not what he said. All of us do things that someone else wouldn't appreciate. But he could see beyond that down into the person and see there's something likable about that person, and I'm choosing to like that person. So he said, I never met a man I didn't like. Well, you know, that was before he even met someone because he chose to like them. He chose to like everyone he met. And he was a person who had a good relationship with most of the people that he met because that was his attitude. Well, let's take a look about yielding. You know, when we don't yield, it's always the root of that is the same way it is with Satan. It's always selfishness. Well, you know, I could yield to what my wife wants to do, but then I'm not going to get to do what I want to do. Instead of like talking about it and saying, well, what could we do that would be good for both of us? In a human sense, we could talk about, well, what's good for everybody? Well, I want to do what I want to do. Selfishness. But with Christ, you know, we shouldn't even consider, you know, first what we want to do. We say, here, we're making plans. First, impress on me what would be good. And as I think about then what I'm going to do and what would be good, then guide me along in this journey because who would know more? Who would have more experience? Who would be wiser? And who would care more about whether it comes out right than Christ himself? Well, let's take a look at a few people who came to that thing where I can, there's that why in the road, I can yield and I can clearly understand, you know, I don't think Christ leaves people in the dark. And, you know, you don't have to worry about how Christ has came to me or I worry about how he's came to you. I believe Christ has came to all people in some way through the Spirit and has impressed on them His will for them. And they have made a free choice. You know, I want to throw in with you and do what you want me to do, or I don't. Now, how the Lord approached them, I, I can't read your mind, and I certainly don't know all your motives. That's a whole another sermon title. We could have motives. You know, we could talk about motives because my motives a lot of times are murky. You know, you think you know my motives, or sometimes even I think my motives. But the Bible says, who can understand the heart? It's evil above all things. That's what the Bible says. So if you think I'm here telling tales out of school, I mean, that's what the Bible says. You know, in other words, who can understand the heart? Who can understand your motives? Because we struggle to understand them ourselves. Why do I want to do the things I do? And Paul talked about that, of course, too. Why am I wanting to do those things? Well, who can understand? You know, let's take a look at a few people. Matthew twenty-seven nineteen. Matthew twenty-seven nineteen. A familiar area here. Matthew twenty-seven. Verse nineteen, talking about Pilate. Jesus was been sent over there. We'll send him over to Pilate. Why is that? Because we need Pilate. You know, you got to remember that the civil leaders had already decided we need to get rid of Christ. They had already came to that choice of yielding. We don't want to yield to Christ. So let's send him over to Pilate so he can rubber stamp this for us and then we'll have somebody to blame. So, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, anybody like to sit on the judgment seat? Another story there for another day. He was sitting on the judgment seat. His wife sent to him, sent him a message saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. <clears throat> now Pilate talked to Jesus. And he understood, I don't see anything. He said, I don't see anything wrong with this guy. I don't see anything bad in this guy. Of course, there was no imperfection in Christ. And even Pilate could understand that. I don't see anything wrong here. They said, oh, he's bad, he's this. I don't see anything wrong with him. So Pilate's weighing, oh, what should I do with Jesus? Isn't that a question you have to answer? What should I do with Jesus? Should I worship him? If I'm not going to, I gotta, I've got to get away from him. So Pilate was weighing that. So his wife even sends him a message through the Spirit. She had been given a dream the night before. This is a righteous man. I need to tell my husband... You need to get away from this situation, have nothing to do. In other words, don't you be sitting in judgment, him. Well, then why did Pilate finally agree to have him condemned? You know, hey, there was social pressure. Anybody here under social pressure any of the time? Yeah. 
you know, especially when we're younger, have ambitions. I'm not going to be accepted if, fill in the blank, pilot sitting here, I'm not, I'm sitting here in the worst place in the world. You know, the last place I'd want to be is you fill in the blanks. Well, for him, the last place I want to be is to be the ruler or have power here in Jerusalem. These people are nuts. They're always in turmoil. There's no way I can win. There's a, all I want to do is impress the emperor and get transferred out of here. Okay? Because the emperor has all ultimate power in his mind. And so I need to appease these people and make this as smooth as I can make it so I can get out of Dodge and go somewhere else where I'm going to be more appreciated and fit in better. The last thing in the world I want to do is upset this crowd around me. But he stops a minute or two to reason with them. Now hang on here, guys. I don't see anything wrong with this Jesus. You're no, but then they start yelling, you're no friend to Caesar if you let him go. Ooh, wait a minute. Branch, you're no friend, do we ever hear that today? You're no friend of such and such politician if you don't do this or that. Oh, I don't want to get on the wrong side of this issue. So he finally said, well, some of these things in the Bible just go on forever, don't they? Bring me a bowl of water. I'm washing my hands. His blood's not on my hands. What term do we hear today? I washed my hands of it. That term's still out there today. You can't wash your hands of it. Pilate couldn't wash his hands of it. Either he was going to yield or he was going to give his life over to sin. And he came to that point, hey, this isn't going to go over well. So I'm washing, he tried, to, I'm washing my hands of it, but that blood will never come off. How about the thief on the cross? Staying here in Matthew. Take a look at Matthew 27, 44. Matthew 27, 44. And the robbers who had been crucified with him were casting insults at him. All kind of insults. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's go over to Luke. He adds something to this. Brother Luke, that great historian... Luke 23, 39. Luke 23, 39 to 43. Luke 23, 39 to 43. And one of the criminals who were hung there was hurling abuse at him. So it may not have been both of them. Or if one of them was, he decided to quit. You're not the Christ. Save yourself and us. In other words... Hey, maybe he does have some power. I'll just taunt him a little bit. Why don't, you, why don't you get busy and save yourself and me too while you're at it? But the other one answered and rebuked him. Do you not even fear God since you were under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly. In other words, I know why I'm here. I broke the law and I've been sentenced to death. I know why I'm here. For we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. How do you know that? See, sometimes the Holy Spirit impresses you with truth and you accept it or you don't. He was impressed. This man's done nothing wrong. He was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you today, you are going to be with me in paradise. So, we can see one, again, like many people in Christ's day, maybe people today saying, I'll believe on you if you save me too. If you do something for me temporally on this earth. But the other one says, put that away. I want to be with you forever. And he yielded. He confessed his sins. Jesus looked on him. He saw an open heart. And he said, I'm going to tell you right now. He passed judgment. You know, we say all judgment has been given to Christ. He passed judgment right there. I'm going to tell you right now. Today, I'm going to tell you. You're going to see me in paradise. You know, I wonder what's going to happen to you or you or me. We don't have to worry about that person, do we? When God's passed judgment, it's good. How about the centurion at the cross? We're going to go back, back to Matthew 27. This time verse 54. 27 verse 54. Should have kept my finger on that, shouldn't I? Matthew 27 verse 54. 
Now the centurion and those who were with him kept guard over Jesus, and they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, and they became very frightened, and they said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Now who revealed that to them? Holy Spirit. We can argue about who put Christ on the cross. You know, we think, well, that centurion and those group of troopers there, they put Christ on the cross. Yeah, but so did you. So did me. So did I. You and I, we got together and put Christ on the cross because, you know, if there was no sin, would Christ be on the cross? No. It was our sin that put Him on the cross. Maybe the difference is the centurion realized, hey, that's the Son of God. Well, if we realize that and proclaim that today, are we going to yield? Are we going to say, I need to step out of the way and let Jesus take the throne? You know, Jesse this morning in Sabbath school kept pointing out what was Lucifer's problem. He kept wanting Jesus to step out of the way so he could take the throne. I belong on the the throne. I should be in the place of the Most High. I should take over the seat of power. That was what that debate was all about. And of course, he eventually had to be cast out of heaven. And now he's telling you and me, we need to have a place of prominence and have Jesus step aside. I, I hate to say it that way, but I believe that's what we're talking about here. We need, we're actually telling Jesus, you need to step aside so that I can take the position of power. In other words, I can do what I want to do, which is what Satan wants me to do. Because we're already given over into sin and all have fallen and come short of the glory of God. All of us sinned and fell into sin through the sin of one man. So I need you to step aside so I can be king. Now really I got someone over the top of me ruling and that's Satan. But I need to sit on the throne so Satan can control things. Or I need to say get thee behind me Satan. I want Jesus. I want to yield to Jesus. And I just want to be a minion. I just want to be a a pawn in Jesus' empire to do whatever He tells me to do, that's what I want to do. Well, you know, if that's true, and if that's our habit, we have to ask Him every time. You know, I'm thinking about uh, doing this. I better talk to Jesus. I'm thinking about going over here. I better talk to Jesus. You know, I'm really upset with somebody at work, at home, at church, at school, whatever. And I'm thinking about saying this. Better talk to Jesus about that. What does He want me to do? And I better yield to whatever advice Jesus gives me. Most of it's right here in the Scripture. And through prayer and His urgings to us. How about King Agrippa? Acts 26, verse 28. Acts. Right after the Gospel, we see the Acts of the Apostles. Acts 26, verse 28. I'll start at 27 here. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Paul was a man of words, and when he said that, we're going to take that as the gospel. Agrippa, I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time you persuade me to, to be a Christian? Almost you persuade me. Why was it almost? Why would it almost, you know, if I'm selling you a new washer or dryer over here and you say, well, I'm almost persuaded to buy that. I didn't get the job done, did I? You know, you walked out of the store, you didn't buy that new washer and dryer or whatever, car, automobile, whatever I'm trying to sell. Oh, you almost persuaded me to do that. But here's the king and Paul in chains is testifying and telling him, Because he loves him too and Jesus loves him and he wants him in the kingdom. But yet Agrippa is saying almost. Well, you know, do you think he's almost going to be saved? Is there any almost saved? You know, there's saved or there's lost. There's not like, well, I think I can get along here. I'm almost persuaded. You know, there's no place for that. And so we see King Agrippa slipping away into a lost situation, at least at that time. I don't know what his history was or how he died. I don't know the rest of his life. But I know at that moment he had chose, I don't want to be saved because I don't want to yield to Christ. Now some of the uh, disciples would get locked up from time to time. Let's take a look about one because they were testifying of Jesus. 
Matter of fact, the Bible says that those who believe in me are going to be persecuted for my sake. Let's take a look at one of those situations, still staying in the book of Acts, but going back to Acts 16. Acts 16, 25 to 31. Acts 16, 25 to 31. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, you know, they'd been beaten, and then they had to lay down probably on straw and be chained up. And I'm sure, you know, if you're like me and you get cut, I've been cut and bruised a few times, the last thing I want to do is be lay down on something that's scratchy and itchy. But they've been beaten, and they've been cut up, and they've been bruised, and they're down there about midnight... And they're complaining. No, they weren't complaining. It says that they were singing hymns of praise to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there came a great earthquake and the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were unfastened. While the jailer had been roused out of sleep and seen the prisoner's doors open, he drew his sword and was just about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners escaped. Because why not? As soon as the other authorities get there, he's going to be killed anyway. Let the prisoners escape. Remember Paul, you know, when he was shipwrecked, the Roman soldiers wanted, let's put all the prisoners to death. Because if one of them gets away, we're going to be put to death. Okay. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, don't do any harm for we're all here. And he called for lights and he rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Well, they didn't equivocate one way or another. How can I almost be saved? Well, what's the least amount I can do to be saved? What minimal amount can I place? What can I do to be saved? Well, you know, I usually say things like that when I know I'm lost. You know, it's like, how can I get where I need to go? Because I'm telling you, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how to get there. So, you know, usually we cry out like that because I don't know what's going on here or how to get where I want to go. And the jailer is realizing, I'm lost. You're saved. I need to get someplace. I, I don't understand. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You and all your household will be saved. You've got to yield. You know, some people want to ask me, Brent, what do you think I should eat? What do you think I should watch? What do you think I should talk about? Is it okay to say this or that? Well, you're asking the wrong person. I'm not the person to ask. You need to talk to Jesus. You know, when you decide I want to yield to Jesus and you talk to Him, you know, what, what should I think about? What should I watch? Where should I go? What should I eat? What should I be thinking? Talk to Jesus. It will become clear to you pretty quick. Now there's room for advice. For our friends, those of us who have tread the path of life for a while to give advice, well, I tried this. It didn't work very well. This did work well. But you know, first go to Jesus. St Staying in Acts, looking at going back to Acts 8 and walking backwards through Acts. 8, 26 to 39, the Ethiopian. Again, we see someone who started here. We'll read a little bit and then we'll talk about it. Acts 8, 26 through 39. The angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, go south to that road that descends Jerusalem to Gaza. I believe the Lord speaks to us today, telling us, Hey, you know, you ought to go over there and talk to that person. Hey, you know, I think somebody's in trouble. Maybe you could be a help. Maybe somebody's discouraged. Maybe you could... Go over there and give them some encouragement. Well, the thing is, Philip, he just went because he was yielding to Christ completely. So he arose and went, and behold, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all the money, all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. <laughs> now, there's a sound treasury principle. First, we go to worship. You know, if I want to be in charge of something, I need to know who's in charge. He was returning and sitting in his chariot and he was reading the prophet Isaiah and the spirit said to Philip, go up and join that chariot. When Philip had run up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, he said, do you understand what you're reading? The place for us, if you're an experienced Bible student, 
Someone says, I'm reading this, I don't understand it. Place for us to help. He said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He, led, he was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before the, its shearer is silent. So he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who shall relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. And the eunuch answered, Philip said, tell me, who does the prophet talk about? Is it himself or someone else? And Philip opened his mouth and began from the scriptures. He preached Jesus. And as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? In other words, I want to yield to Christ. I've seen who Christ is. I've read. I don't think that's the first time that that individual was reading and thinking about Christ. I think he was drawn to Christ, as everyone is. And he was reading and studying and looking at the book, the Old Testament there, the only testament that was available at that time. And he was thinking about it. And he was like, I'm drawn to this, but I just don't understand it. And the moment he understood, someone helped him, Philip, to understand, he said, wait a minute, there's water. What is preventing me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And he came up out of the water, and the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, but he went on his way rejoicing. You know, when I rejoice, it's usually because I think I have really in a good situation here. What better situation are you going to be in? <laughs> Proverbs fourteen twelve. This is a couple more texts here, and we're going to be drawing to a close. But Proverbs fourteen twelve is very familiar. When you hear it, I think almost everyone has heard that there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Now, this is what we've been talking about, yielding. I can say, this is the way I see it. Brother Jay, you know, this is the way I see it. <clears throat> well, is that God's way? I don't know, but that's the way I see it. <clears throat> There's a way that seems right to a man. We see that every day in the world. You know, in all kind of public discourse, we see, see ways that seem right to a man. But where do they lead? You know, many times when we see something or I read something in a book, my wife and I read and study a lot of different things and look at things. And, you know, in a secular setting, I always say, well, where, how's God figure into this? You know, well, they're, they're doing this and they're doing that and they're making plans. But I say, where does God fit into this? I don't understand. You know, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, it seemed as if the whole world, I was nine years old, it seemed like the whole world was coming apart. And we didn't know what to think. And you'd hear the news, and we heard, oh, the Russians are going to be bombing us. We're all going to be blown up. Well, there's a real fear, you know, in the Cold War that maybe that's what's going to happen when you're nine years old. You know, you think, well, what's going to happen? <laughs> and I think the, our military stirred it up. We had supersonic jet over flying regularly, and on at night they'd go break the sonic barrier, you know, as they were flying over. And there was fear. There's a way that seemed right to a man, and President Kennedy's council was pressing him, let's do this, let's do that. And he would draw them together. They would talk about their options. They would look at it. They would look at what they should do. And they would tell him, let's do this. Fortunately, Kennedy was a cool head and had a lot of experience. But one afternoon during that Cuban Missile Crisis, he was driving from one federal building, being chauffeured with a heavy escort, I might add, from one uh, public place to another that he had to get to in the presidential limousine. And just then they came, turned a corner, and there was a small Catholic church sitting there on the corner. And he told the driver, stop a minute. The driver stopped, <coughs> and he got out. He opened the door. Well... That was pretty alarming because usually the presidential motorcade doesn't stop. <clears throat> and the Secret Service were like, whoa, <laughs> this isn't part of the plan. 
He got out of that car and he walked in the back door of that church and he knelt down and he was in that church for just a moment or two. Then he came back and got in his limousine and he went on to the appointment he had. But you know, I think he realized, hey, I got problems here that are bigger than I can solve. We got problems here that are outside the realm of humanity. We need God. We need to yield to what His will is. We need God's intervention in what's going on. And fortunately, I think he acted correctly, and at least we know that the world went on at that time, and humanity didn't destroy a great part of itself in a useless war. But you know, we can realize it's time to relent. It's time to yield. Human ways don't, don't work out. Finishing up here, we think of Hebrews 2, verse 2 and 3. Hebrews 2, verse 2 and 3. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, boy, if I stopped there, that'd be pretty, pretty rough news, wouldn't it? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. No need, you know, how are we going to escape if we don't yield? That's what it's talking about. We've heard the good news. We need to yield to Christ. You know, if we give Christ total control, Paul says it in a different way. He says to try and make every thought captive to the will of Christ. Boy, that's a challenge. Do you think, and I don't have to raise your hands because I can tell you right now, not all mine are. But that's a goal, you know, to have every thought be captive of the will of Christ. Think of what the world was like and will be like in the earth made new. You think about, you know, there'll be no hunger. There'll be no fear. You know, and I think of a perfect world. The trees will be right where they should be. The animals will be right where they should be. There'll be no, I won't think, I won't be afraid of the animals. They will, I love animals. They won't be afraid of me. You know, I won't accidentally step on some ants. Why is that? Because the ants are under the will of God and they'll know where to be. And I will know where to be. Why is that? Because God will be guiding my steps. You know, you think about, well, how did the world exist without accidental death? You know, we have accidental deaths a million times a moment here. Insects and different things. Well, still life. It's precious to God. You know, God said... In Nineveh, when he sent Jonah, well, how can you neglect that 120,000 people? Not to mention all those animals. And you don't even care about them, but I do. Well, God cares about all death. And yet we live in a world that has constant death because of unyielding, you know. Everything wants to yield except we who have a mind to choose, we don't want to yield. Everything else comes in its season because it's yielding. Why do seeds pop open? Because they're yielding to the will of God. You know, why do trees leaf out? They're yielding to the will of God. And yet we who know better so many times don't. But I think about what the world made new will be like. Everything knows its place. Not only knows it, but is so anxious to fulfill the will of God. God, what do you want me to do? That's what I'm going to do. Why will the world be perfect? Because everyone will willingly be under God's control. Can you agree with me on that? We'll all be there saying... What do you want me to do, Lord? That's exactly what I want to do. Why can't we begin right now today and just say, Lord, what do you want me to do? I really don't like Ben, but wait a minute. (laughs) You love him, and he's made in your image. What should be my attitude? I love Ben. I would be looking after Ben's well-being. I would be hoping that Ben is doing well today. I ought to be thinking about Brother Jay. I ought to be thinking about this person and that person. You know, I ought to look around at work, at home, at church, at school, in my community. Everywhere I go, I should be thinking, hey, maybe there's somebody God wants me to help today. Lord, can you help me? I'm, I, I'm pretty sure I, I don't have to even have too much help to find somebody who needs help. Now, I might need help in deciding what I should do. God, how could I help people the best, the most? What's, what do you want me to do? But first I have to yield and say, wait a minute, I'm not the most important entity. You are. So I need to yield. 
And that's my prayer today, is that we can learn to yield, and not just yield today or this moment, but it becomes our habit. Well, it's my habit to yield and say, wait a minute, your interest comes before mine. I need to yield to that, and then we need to let Christ lead us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Another Sabbath day, a chance to take a rest from our daily labors, to come together and worship. And all this worship is meant for one thing, to glorify your name. We're asking for power to live a holy life, Lord, and we know that you, how much more you want to give this to us just now, that we can live under your care. Remember us today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.